<laughs> All right, folks, so welcome to lesson eight, where we look at nerve signaling. And this is kind of the, the concept that we were alluding to earlier today when I was talking about how a message is sent to and from that peripheral and central nervous system, the afferent, efferent uh, nerves, and kind of connecting the idea of homeostasis as a whole in terms of that closed system in general. So when we think about nerve signaling and, and, and nerves in general and how they communicate with each other, we need to think of something called the neural circuit. And these neural circuits are gonna consist of three important types of neurons, which we've kind of looked at already. The apparent neuron, which is responsible for receiving that sensory information and those signals from stimulus outside or inside the body. Those interneurons in the spinal cord, which determine what to do with the instruct or the information. And then they're going to determine what to do essentially in most cases and in some cases. Uh, and then they're going to instruct those efferent neurons to cause a response. So when we think about neural, neural circuits and we think about those interneurons, we're talking about the ones that are responsible for those quick, rapid responses, okay? And, and I'll talk about what I mean as we move forward because we don't really get into too much detail with regards to the cerebral uh, processing and nerve signaling because as you can imagine, the human brain is the most complex thing on this planet in my opinion. Um, and so it is tricky to kind of get that understanding under our belt at this stage in the game. So we'll, we'll stick to those uh, aspects of the spinal cord and a little bit of the, the bottom parts of the brain with regards to those inner neurons and how homeostasis is balanced and maintained. So the simplest, the simplest neural circuit is called the reflex arc. Okay, it's called the reflex arc. And as the name implies, it is going to cause reflexes. So I alluded to this earlier with regards to some of the reflex of arcs uh, in terms of the specific example that instead of the pot, we have that super hot deep fried French fry, which uh, now I will have to go get some French fries later today in an attempt to make myself feel good because Lord knows they are the perfect food. So a reflex arc is the information that is relayed through an afferent neuron uh, through the apparent neuron, and it does not need to travel to the brain to elicit a response. Again, that important distinction here is it does not need to transfer that information to the brain. It is possible to uh, elicit a response from that interneuron within the spinal cord, right? That si it simply sends that signal to the spinal cord where those interneurons will then cause that reflex reaction. And again, why do we want to have that reflex reaction limited to those interneurons within that spinal cord, why not send it to the brain? Well, it's gonna be quick. We want something fast. Reflexes need to be fast. It's gonna prevent damage and it will delay that pain sensation as much as possible. So here I have the uh, little bit of a diagram that I will pull up later in terms of the notes and to show you a little bit more detail, but that pain receptor or the sensory aspect of the afferent neuron in the finger will send that message and it transmit that impulse of, the, of, holy smokes, it's hot, to that spinal cord. Those interneurons are going to integrate that information and they're going to use positive and negative feedback loops, which I'll talk about later. They're going to use positive and negative feedback loops to kind of send that message down the efferent neuron of, hey, you need to stop this. Get that out of there and you'll reflexively pull on the bicep and tricep muscles will contract and, and, and relax in opposite. And that muscles grouping will move your hand away from that hot pot in this example, or drop that hot French fry. And it will essentially be quick, prevent damage and delay that pain sensation. Because I, I talk about that delayed pain sensation up here. You still feel it eventually. And it's quite short, the time span that it delays it, but we're talking uh, you know, milliseconds or seconds, that's enough to, to make a difference with regards to survival in the wild. So it's important to reflect back on that connection to that evolutionary biology component, as well as our understanding with some aspects of positive and negative feedback, which I will go into a little bit more detail later, but not too much. Okay, so how do those neurons within the PNS, afferent, efferent, interneuron uh, within the spinal cord, how do all of those neural communications work? So we're gonna look at a closer look of that neural communication with regards to the axon, terminal, and dendrites. Uh, and we're gonna talk about something called the synapse, which is the connection point between neurons 
or between neurons and effectors. R recall, those effectors are the things that allow for that response to be elicited as a result of that signal that the neuron sends to it. So I won't talk too much about the effector and neuron relationship because some of the aspects of our understanding with regards to muscle contraction and, um, and the like, it's a little bit above our pay grade, so to speak. Uh, but I will talk about the general aspects of chemical and electrical synapses. So that synapse, again, is that connection point between neurons or between a neuron and the effector, the thing that it will affect. So let's take a look at chemical synapses first. The direction of signal, always, 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 from dendrite to cellular body to axon, uh, and then into that new, that axon terminal presynaptic cell, it's called. Uh, when we look at chemical synapses, we're looking at spaces between cells. There are receptors between them that, or there's a space between them. One cell will have receptors. One cell will have some type of chemical messenger, chemical signal. So when we talk about those chemical signals that are responsible for kind of transmitting that information through that chemical synapse, with that connection between chemically between two neurons or two cells that need to communicate, we're talking about neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters are a form of chemical signal. When we looked at hormones in our last couple of lessons and we looked at any type of signaling pathway, we're talking about something similar to neurotransmitters, just neurotransmitters are responsible for that neuron to neuron or neuron to effector communication. Uh, they're gonna pass through a tiny gap that's called the synaptic cleft. That's the gap between the two cells and that neurotransmitter will allow the nerve to essentially pass that signal to one another. The specific neurotransmitter will elicit a specific response in the cell that it is connected from or that it is connected to. And when that message reaches that new cell, that new message will be propagated down that pathway along that neuron, and that message will then be transferred on to the next cell and so on and so forth until that effect is realized. With regards to electrical synapses, we have a direct connection, a direct connection between that terminal cell presynaptic cleft, that terminal ending part of that cell, that neuron, and a direct connection or direct contact to some type of receiver. So when we think about that, you need to think about that direct contact between two neurons that allows an electrical current to pass between them, thus carrying a signal. And if you recall back from all the way our macromolecules and our ATP synthesis and all that good stuff that we feels like a, a million years ago, this direct contact and that current uh, that will allow that message to be passed on, that allowing of movement is going to allow that, or the allowing of charged particles and the movement of those charged particles will allow that, uh, that current, that electrochemical gradient to start to form and it will, be, uh, uh, it will be used to propagate a message from one cell to the next. And I'll, I'll talk about the specifics of each of those now. So how does an electrical signal get conducted and passed on from one cell to the next? Um, because if you recall back to when we looked at ATP synthesis, that electrochemical gradient was formed within one single cell, and that allowed for the generation of ATP or the generation of other molecules that were used in metabolic processes uh, and what have you. But animal cells have very interesting differences from other cells. And in the, in the important component is that they differ in that there's a separation of positive and negative charges across their cellular membranes. Again, this is called that membrane potential, the ability for an electrochemical gradient to be formed. It is an imbalance of charges on either side. This is caused by an imbalance of potassium, sodium ions, as well as anions like chlorine and other negatively charged ions. We'll talk a little bit about those because this is the first time we're introducing that concept to you, that negative charged particle within that interstitial fluid or within that cytoplasm to help kind of maintain that charge. Uh, but most cells maintain the same membrane potential throughout their lives by the use of a sodium potassium pump. So this sodium and potassium pump this is going to be one of the ways, one of the important ways with which a cell, specifically neurons and anything that's relating to neurons, will utilize ATP to maintain that membrane potential. So when I talk about that, we're looking at active transport. It's going to use ATP 
to move ions from low to a high concentration. Just like at the beginning of this class when I talked about how important it was when we understand active and passive transport, this is a really good example of that active transport where energy needs to be spent to ensure that membrane potential is kept and it's that membrane potential we're gonna harness to send a message down a neuron. So neurons and muscle cells are excitable. They can be excited because they have the ability to rapidly change that membrane potential in response to various stimulus. This excitation is caused by a sudden rapid flow of ions across the cellular membrane. I will say that again, because again, this is the idea that we're studying here is that ability for information to be passed from cell to cell. And this excitation that is caused by a sudden rapid flow of ions across that cell membrane is the means with which we do that. So when you look at that chart that I have there, okay, the charge particle concentration inside versus outside. Inside the cell, inside the cell, you're gonna have an overall more negative charge, okay? Because we have some anions in there. Specifically, it's not specifically chlorines, it's other anions, but on average, there's gonna be a more negative charge than the outside of the cell, okay? And I use that A minus just to represent anions, okay? So we have a more negatively charged interior, a more positively charged exterior, right? And it allows for the idea of that, again, that electrochemical gradient and that membrane potential to be harnessed to send a message down that neuron. So how it works is this. The resting potential is the membrane potential when the neuron is unstimulated, i.e. not conducting an electrical signal. This resting potential of an axon is usually around minus 70 millivolts. And I can use the negative because we're talking in terms of the ability to change absolute value, right? So don't necessarily focus too much on the negative 70 millivolt component. Just recognize that that resting potential of an axon is negative 70 millivolts. When at rest, ion channels are closed. The cells that are responsible for creating that imbalance or cells that have an any imbalance of charges across the membrane are known as excited or polarized, i.e. not minus 70 millivolts. It's important to recognize that when we talk about excited or polarized, we're talking about a deviation from that resting potential. Whatever that deviation may be, we can mean different things. We don't really learn too much about that difference between that, but we're talking about a differentiate, a different charge or a different resting potential value, okay? So that resting potential value is minus 70. Any type of cell that have an imbalanced charge across its membrane are known to be excited or polarized. And it doesn't matter if it's above or below minus 70, because that aspect is it's different from the minus 70. So there's some notes there in 11.2 uh, that you can look at after we finish this lesson, uh, after we finish this lesson, uh, because ultimately it'll help with your understanding of how those uh, resting potentials work. And I'd be happy to answer questions again after this lesson, uh, but we'll keep going forward and we'll look at the action potential of a neuron because we can connect those ideas a little bit as we go. So when a neuron is excited, the voltage difference across a nerve cell membrane changes rapidly. This change is called the action potential, a change from the rest, okay? That change from the rest. So phase one, and I think it's broken down into six phases if I'm not mistaken, but I think I only grouped them together, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that bridge when we get there. So phase one is the initiation of that action potential. So again, recall back to what we've known so far. We have that membrane potential in a neuron. It's resting potential is minus 70 millivolts. That means when all of the ion channels are closed, we have a more negative inside than we do outside, right? That's where that minus 70 millivolts comes from. We have a more negative inside than we do of the outside. So in order to send that signal down, we have to have a change in that resting potential charge, i.e. that minus 70. So phase one is the initiation of the action potential. This action potential begins with a stimulus. And it's important to recognize that that stimulus will cause a positive charge or positive charges from outside the neuron to flow inward, making that inside of the cell less negative. It's caused by chemical or electrochemical uh, electrical synapse signals, either a neurotransmitter or to that direct contact 
and it's going to essentially stimulate that ion channel to open up and allow for more positive ions to flow into the cell. So sodium ions will flow into the cell at that initiation of the action potential. It's going to make it less negative, and this will start the whole uh, initiation of the action potential. This is called depolarization. Depolarization. This continues until it reaches the threshold potential of approximately negative 50 to negative 55 millivolts. Again, we're increasing the positive charge of that inside of the cell, and it's getting less and less negative until it reaches that threshold potential at about minus 50 millivolts, okay, at about minus 50 millivolts. This is where we can start the whole process of the action potential because now we've initiated it. Step two is the depolarization phase. Once that threshold potential is reached, the sodium channels open up and it causes that membrane potential to increase drastically. So whereas before we had a couple opening up to increase that action potential to start that post process going, now we've reached the depolarization phase where those sodium channels are burst open basically. So sodium is really gonna start to influx into the cell and it's going to cause a, um, <laughs> if I answer that question, I answer the, the question for the, the lab. So I'll let you think about it after we go through this, uh, this lesson. So when those sodium ion channels burst wide open, it allows for that action potential or that membrane potential to increase sharply. So we were at negative 50 and it was slowly going up until it got to that negative 50. And now it's depolarized and it's skyrocketing. The, the action potential, membrane potential is, is huge increase, huge. And it's going to happen in less than one millisecond inside the neuron, okay? It becomes positively charged now. We've reached that zero millivolt potential. We've passed it. And now the internal, the internal part of the membrane or the internal part of that cell is more positively charged as a result of that sodium moving passively in from those gates being wide open. So that's phase two, that depolarization. Those sodium channels have opened. The sodium moved in freely because of that, um, that desire to balance it, but it moved in so quickly that it actually made it positively charged. Phase three, we reach, we, we reach something called the peak action potential. This action potential momentarily reaches a peak approximately positive 30 millivolts. And at this point, the sodium channels will close and become inactive. Well, the potassium channels now can open up and allow that potassium to exit. Because if you recall, the inside of that cell is now more positive. So it wants to, to reach that balance, right? It wants to reach that balance. So it will do so by allowing that potassium to flow freely out. So that sodium and potassium channels will close slash open based on the membrane potential. The potassium channels open at around 30 millivolts, whereas the sodium uh, channels close at around that point. So they, they work in conjunction. So now that potassium wants to leave because those channels are open. The outside is more negative. Potassium can per easily flow out of the cell and that will start to decrease or repolarize that neuron. So phase four is those potassium channels open the outward movement of those potassium ions will cause the membrane potential to fall rapidly, i.e. it will move towards the resting potential, that minus 70 millivolts. And now phase five, we're looking at the repolarization as a result of potassium channels, uh, allowing that potassium to flow out. As it repolarizes and becomes more and more negative from the potassium leaving, we're looking at those channels to start to close slowly, causing the membrane potential to drop even lower than the resting potential. So it drops past that point and it's called hyperpolarization. And this happens because there's a delay in the potassium uh, ion channels closing once they reach that minus 70 millivolt. Where when we looked at those sodium channels opening and it happens in less than a millisecond, potassium channels take a little bit longer to close. So we see what's called hyperpolarization. It goes past that threshold of minus 70 millivolts. And then lastly, we have something called stabilization. The stabilization is where the membrane potential stabilizes and it wants to return to that resting potential in preparation to achieve the next act action potential. It's going to achieve, it's achieved by those sodium and potassium pumps. And we talked about sodium and, and potassium pumps in active transport above, as well as in previous units. So it gets back to that stabilized minus 70 millivolt by having those channels closed 
uh, the sodium and potassium channels, and it will actively pump sodium, potassium in or out to reach that minus 70 millivolt charge. This is all happening within one neuron, and it's all happening within a couple of milliseconds. So I think it's pretty fantastic that, that that's the case. So we have the refractory period, and that refractory period is the period of time during which the threshold for the action potential is significantly higher than usual. This will allow the membrane to return to that resting potential, and it ultimately keeps the signal moving only in one direction. So when we talked about that movement of that from dendrite to cell body down axon to axon terminals, it can only move in one direction due to this refractory period. It takes a bit of time uh, for them to go back to that resting potential. And as a result of that, the action potential is slightly higher after that fact. So it won't recatalyze that reaction going backwards. It can only travel in one direction. Once those ion channels have opened, they essentially need time to reset before they can open again. And this, is the, this allows that nerve impulse to only move in one direction. And it allows for that uh, efficiency of signal transfer. It allows for no message to, to get sent backwards and it, it essentially helps to make those neurons op, uh, function at an optimal uh, efficiency. So those are the six stages or phases, I should say, of the action potential. 100% uh, you're definitely gonna have to know that. It's very important to understand that process. Uh, that's why I'm giving you so much time to, to read over it and look over it before tomorrow's quiz. Uh, so hopefully we can utilize that time well. So the last little part that I wanna talk about um, is kind of the idea of chemical synapses after I finish tying into the idea of, of that electrochemical um, or the electrical components. Uh, it's important to recognize that those different neurons will have slightly different time frames, and it really depends on the type of neuron and what its job is. Not every stimulus is actually strong enough to add, allow that action potential to happen, and it needs to overcome that threshold um, in order to, yes, action potential is referring to the electrical synapse. So it needs to overcome that threshold potential to depolarize all, an entire neuron. This aspect is known as the all or nothing principle. Okay, it's either all or nothing. If it doesn't reach that enough stimulus to get to that minus 50 millivolts uh, due to whatever neurotransmitter was responsible or whatever electrochemical component was responsible, it, it won't reach that point. So once it begins, uh, the action potential will continue independent of that stimulus. So it does not require further input from the stimulus, but it needs to reach that threshold in order to go through that. So when you think about the electrochemical, oops, where are we? That, that action potential, sorry, with regards to, uh, I get, Celia, what you're asking with regards to that question. Um, it's, it's taking in consideration chemical and electrical synapses. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of clarify that question in a little bit because um, that question is a little, it's a little loaded, but I, I will talk about it afterwards uh, because it's required for both aspects of chemical and electrical synapse communication. So how does that signal, we looked at that one signal happening in one uh, neuron from the cell body along the axon and that action potential and the stimulus required, but how do we get that conduction across that chemical synapse? How do we get that one neuron to tell another neuron that you need to do the same thing that I just did? Because most vertebrae neurons communicate by neurotransmitters. It's a unique uh, vertebrate component. There are other animals and living beings that use some type of neurotransmitter, but it is very, very unique to vertebrates. This, and it's because they allow neurons to receive input from hundreds or even thousands of axon terminals at the same time. However, they need to be able to release diffuse and bind to that next cell in order to cause that, um, that message to be transferred on. But then this, this can cause a delay in transmission that does not happen in that chemical signaling. And it's interesting to think about it in this context because when you realize that that um, release, diffuse and binding of that next cell, it's gonna cause a delay in that signal. And um, it's important to recognize that it's not the most efficient way to do it, but it allows for some pretty unique things to happen with regards to chemical signals. So again, just like when we talked about that direction of signal, right? It's gonna always come down the axon and then when we're looking at the connection between one neuron to the next, it's important to realize that that, uh, that ending part of the axon will directly connect in some way, shape or form to another neuron. 
So when we think about the action potential reaching that axon terminal of that presynaptic neuron, we now know that that neuron needs to send information to the next neuron to say, hey, keep going. So the idea of calcium ions needs to be thought of now. Again, those ions in general, they perform a role. So now here we have calcium ions that are going to uh, enter the axon terminal. And those neurotransmitters are gonna be released by exocytosis. Essentially, we have these synaptic vesicles that carry this neurotransmitter that the cell makes. And as a result of these calcium ions flowing in, it's going to release that neurotransmitter. These neurotransmitters are gonna to bind to the postsynaptic receptor, so the next cell. And then it will allow those ion channels to open in that new neuron, essentially transmitting that information onto the next cell. So these neurotransmitters effectively cause those channels to open and allow ions to enter the next cell, and it triggers that cell's uh, action potential. And then that cell will get to the end of their axon terminal in that presynaptic neuron, and it will generate a new action potential in a new cell via neurotransmitters within that cell. So the neurotransmitters um, with regards to activation on ion channels is a very interesting component. Uh, human beings are fascinating in the regard that sometimes if they have too much or too little of those neurotransmitters, it can lead to some mental health problems. We don't talk too, too much about that um, because it's a little bit, again, complex in that regard. Uh, but there are two neurotransmitters that I kind of want to talk a little bit about. Uh, acetylcholine is responsible for the muscle contractions in all cells. There are glands to release hormones uh, that are also affected by acetylcholine. And it, it does have a huge impact on mood, emotion, and attentiveness. So when you think about all of those different factors that it can contribute to, uh, you start to really realize and appreciate how many different roles that these neurotransmitters can fill, fulfill. Sorry. And then lastly, we have endorphins. You've probably heard of endorphins before. They are produced when doing things that feel good, activities that can cause euphoria, or in some cases that will cause pain relief, eating, exercise, the act of sex, all three of those things are examples of things that produce endorphins that help you feel good about the thing that you are doing. It's important to also realize that there are also many toxins and drugs that interact with neurotransmitters or the specifically the receptors in either to, uh, in either to inhibit or to stimulate the actions of those neurotransmitters. So some drugs and other toxins can actually inhibit or uh, like in, stop the action potential from being sent on to certain parts of the brain or from certain parts of the body, or it can cause it to stimulate it and send even more signals from those neurons to the parts of the body that they're trying to target. All right, folks, that is it for the lesson today. Hopefully uh, you have some questions and you can ask them. It's a bit content heavy, I get it. That's why I wanted to really give you the rest of this day to digest it, think about it, ask questions, and then tomorrow we will have that quiz. So I'll stop recording here and answer some of those questions that have been asked already.